আপনারা দেখছেন টকিং পয়েন্ট সৌজন্যে মাহবুব অ্যান্ড কো অ্যাকাউন্টেন্টস Welcome back. Before the break, we were talking to our distinguished guest today, Suruhi Hamid, about her film at the epicenter, about the tsunami in Indonesia that, took, that uh, rocked and drowned the place and, and caused havoc in 2004. And we were talking about Bandar Aceh. Mm -hmm. Now, let's journey back to Bandar Aceh and your experience there. Well, Bandache was just an incredible place to arrive at. When I got there, um, I was given the mission to see if there's a documentary to be made. And before going there, I remember this stark image mm -hmm. of a mosque that was left standing. Yes. Everything else around it was devastated yes. except for this one mosque. And I thought, wow, how interesting and is that? And the very devoted it said that it was just a miracle. Yeah, absolutely. So when I got to Bandache, I made my way to this mosque which was in a village called Lampuk mm -hmm. and when I got there I found that there's a few tents that had been set up mm -hmm. and some of the people had moved back mm -hmm. and I thought gosh how come you've come back this it, it, it was only sort of like 500 yards from the sea mm -hmm. and you'd have thought people who'd been through the tsunami would yeah. be too scared to go how back and live. How soon after tsunami you went there? I went there four weeks after the tsunami mm -hmm. So in a way, as all the news crews were leaving, I went in afterwards. And mm -hmm. people were saying, you're a bit late, aren't you? And mm -hmm. I said, no, I've come to tell the story about how the people are going to cope Coping, yeah. after the whole event. So I um, found this um, uh, mosque and the village, and I found some people there. And I found that some of the people had come back. And I said, why have you come back to live here? Mm -hmm. And they said, because our mosque is still here, so we have to come back. It's a sign for us to come back and uh, rebuild our village. So then I decided that I was going to make a film about them trying to rebuild their village. Mm -hmm. And I went there over three times over a period of five months just to see how they developed. And I must say they were the most amazing people I have filmed with. Uh, yeah. Approximately how many people were there? I mean those inhabitants I've, of the village? There was about, I would say there was about 120 people at the most who'd come back to live there, yeah. mainly men. It was mainly men who survived, very few women. I think all in all, there was about, oh, about 10 or so women who'd survived. And children, there mm -hmm. were only about 12 children who'd survived. And, um, and so I thought uh, it would be really interesting to make a film about mm -hmm. these people. Mm -hmm. So I found three, three main characters. One was a young man who um, had survived, and he was someone who had been a bit of a beach type person showing tourists around mm -hmm. and everything and then the tsunami happened and it kind of changed his life and the other person was a young woman who was mm -hmm. 21 and she was one of the few women who had survived her and her sister the rest of her family had died these are the natives of that area yes completely from that part lived there for you know their family had been there for generations and then the third person was a young boy called henry mm -hmm. he was um, 11 years old and this child had lost every single person of his family he was an orphan there was lots of others who'd lost fa family members mm -hmm. but they all had either a sister or a brother or a father someone had survived this child had absolutely no one and so I chose him as my third character. And it was really interesting because with, with him, in the beginning, I couldn't even get anything out of him because he was so traumatized. Mm -hmm. So it took me weeks and weeks to really break through, to start talking to him and befriend him and get him to tell me his story. And, uh, and, and I saw him develop over those five months where he went from a very traumatized young boy into a confident you know, young, young person as the weeks and months went on. Um, and over those weeks and months, we saw how these people didn't just sit around waiting for aid. They decided to take matters in their own hand and they started clearing the land. They were um, uh, started building little homes for themselves. Mm -hmm. Some, there, there was one um, couple who got married. They had both been, had lost their husband and their wife. And so in the time I was there, th they got married. So it was wonderful to see these people pull their lives together on their own. You know, they mm -hmm. had lots of help. In fact, Bill Clinton and George um, Bush Sr. 
came to their village. So while I was forming there, they came there and promised lots of help. Mm -hmm. And lots of NGOs were uh, promising help. But all of that took time. And these people thought, instead of sitting around, right. we can do something for ourselves. And, you know, the thing that kept them going was their faith. That's mm -hmm. the one thing that they had in their hearts. And every day they'd go to the mosque and they'd pray yeah, together. Going back to the mosque again, I would like to ask you, nothing was destroyed. The mosque was intact. Yes. It was amazing. And I think it's to do with the architecture of the mm -hmm. mosque. Because of all the archways, yes. what happened was when the tsunami came, the water went through those archways and yeah. so the rest of the building was left standing yeah. whereas a lot of the other houses because yeah. they were solid houses they were just knocked over yeah. the, the 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 strength of the wave was so tough that it just knocked all the other houses but the mosque because it was big and mm -hmm. it had these arches the water just flowed through it and so it didn't knock it down but you know the tsunami the wave was so high mm -hmm. you could see the mark on top of the turret so you could see how high the wave had been 30 feet, a feet high. It was incredible, actually. And so these people, their mosque saved them in a way. Right, from incredible to a stranger, uh, you end up, uh, next film that on my list here is Rocky Star and the Mullahs. Uh, and, and then when I saw this, I thought of uh, Jamshed Junaid, see, a rock star, Pakistani rock star who became uh, a very religious, devoted person, yes. see, but this is not about him. No, this was not <laughs> about Junaid Jamshed, but it was about um, a friend of his, um, uh, Salman. Salman Ahmed, mm -hmm. who is the, um, uh, the founder of Janoon, the band mm -hmm. Janoon, which, of course, we all know is one of the most popular and successful mm -hmm. uh, Pakistani bands to ever come out. And the, the idea behind that film was that um, it was during... Um, in 2003 and the mullahs had banned music in pakistan they said that it was haram so salman let went let me add here see all these films were for bbc2 yes all for bbc2 for a strand called this world right and this actually this rock star in the mullahs was for a strand called storyville which is mm -hmm. one of the top documentary strands on the bbc so um salman wanted to do a journey through his country to challenge the mullahs and to find out why is music haram and mm -hmm. is it haram or is it very much part of the Pakistani culture. So we did a journey through Pakistan to mm -hmm. really look at the soul of Pakistan, to see how music and poetry and Sufism is very mm -hmm. much as much a part of Pakistan as the kind of more extreme fundamental forms of Islam, which really are a Wahhabi form of Islam which has come from Saudi Arabia into Pakistan and it's having a, a lot of um, impact and you know with the sort of Taliban in Afghanistan Pakistan had been sort of taken over by this very strong religious um, approach to the country so politically it was changing there was a lot of turmoil this was during the time of Musharraf right and so um, uh, the film was really Salman on a journey to find out where is Pakistan heading? Well, we have about five minutes, but uh, I would like to, you to talk about some of the, thing, some of the very uh, interesting films that you have made about women, wedding, and war, and me. Uh, that's about Afghanistan, again, uh, produced for BBC. Yes. Isn't it? See? Tell us something about how did you go there, and uh, what did you find out, and has the... Has really the women of Afghanistan been liberated after this? Mm. <laughs> yes. Well, that was exactly why we made the film. We wanted to see... Um, it was actually a film made to uh, go out at the time of International Women's Day. So mm -hmm. there were two films made. One was in Afghanistan and the other one was made in Congo. And the idea was to look at women's lives in two of the most difficult parts of the world. So I went to Afghanistan with a young Afghan woman who's grown up in Britain. Mm -hmm. And the idea was to take her back. Her name is uh, Nelifa Hedayat. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea was to take her back to Afghanistan to see what it was like to be a woman in Afghanistan. And so we did a journey. And of course, we did find that there were some changes. You know, there are women now working in television. Women are getting a lot more opportunities. We filmed at um, a program called um, Afghan Model. So there were women taking part in this um, competition. It's like an X Factor type of um, mm -hmm. competition. Um, and there's lots more women now working and, um, you know, but this is in Kabul. The moment you leave, leave Kabul, 
a lot of women's lives are still very, very difficult. And uh, they, they've got a restricted lifestyle and they've got a lot of challenges ahead of them. So really this was a film that humbled Nell, our character. As she went around Afghanistan, she realized that there were women who are very strong and they're fighting simple things like having the right to go to school, mm -hmm. having the right to work, having the right to marry Even sometimes to want. come out of the house, you see. Yes, oh yes. I mean, obviously they are out of the house and as long as they're covered, they can, they can go out. But they still have a lot of restrictions. I mean, we mm -hmm. filmed in a prison in mm -hmm. uh, Herat and a lot of these uh, women had been arrested simply for being out without uh, a male. Proper, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and they were accused, or some of the women had run away because they were in unhappy marriages. Yes. The most harrowing part was filming in a hospital. And there were lots of young women who had um, uh, tried to kill themselves by setting fire to themselves because they were in very, very unhappy marriages. Quite, you know, quite a lot of them, there were 15-year-olds who, who had been married off to 50-year-old mm -hmm. men. So there's, Afghanistan still has a long way to go before the women are liberated. Afghanistan again features in one of your other films, like Breaking into Britain. Yes. See? An Afghan uh, young person. Yes. And somebody from West Africa into UK. That's about migration, isn't yes. it? Yes. This was a film Briefly about... Briefly, because we are running out okay. of time. See? This was a film about economic migrants who are right. leaving war-torn countries to try and get to Britain. And we followed, uh, one of the f journeys we followed was the Afghan migrants journey, mm -hmm. the difficult places they go through to try and get to Britain and really how difficult it is for them to get to Britain and most of them get stuck in different parts of, um, uh, you know, like in Iran or in Turkey and they never make it to Europe. Yeah. Some, some make it uh, up to Calais and then, and then they, they get stuck and they're standing there looking at Britain just on the other side of the yes, channel yes. and they never make but it. Why does Britain attract so many people? Well, interestingly, it, they feel that Britain is still a very tolerant society uh -huh. and that they give uh, asylum seekers a lot of rights. Yes. And so, interestingly enough, Britain is still seen as a country which is kind to... Is, is it um, also immigrants. the language? Because Language as well, because of the former colonies, because mm -hmm. a lot of people, uh, these are former British colonies, and so they, they feel that English is an easier language to work with. And there's lots of immigrants well, already it's, here. Well, it's, it's a privilege, Rui, to have you here. And... Uh, uh, just a few seconds that we have got, I would like you to say a few words to our younger viewers who, who would probably like to uh, follow what you have done in their lives. Because a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of younger Asians have come into journalism yes. and, and, and the mainstream media, but uh, not many in filmmaking. See, that's your camera. Well, I would say that pick up a camera, it can be a mobile phone. It's very easy to make films these days because everyone has the technology. Get out there and tell the stories that matter to you. That's the important thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's nice having you here. It's a pleasure to be and here. A, and a pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, viewers, for being with us. And uh, we'll meet again next week, same time, same channel, with another distinguished guest. Thank you.